morning and welcome to the first meeting of the Health and Social Care and Sport Committee 2024. I have received no apologies for today's meeting. The first item on our agenda is to decide whether to take items 5, 6, 7 and 8 in private and whether to consider in private at future meetings a draft report on the National Care Services Scotland Bill. Are members agreed? Thank you. The second item on our agenda is to take evidence from the Cabinet Secretary for NHS Recovery, Health and Social Care as part of the Committee's scrutiny of the Scottish, Gov Scottish Government's Budget 2024-25. And for this morning's session, I welcome to the meeting Michael Matheson, a Cabinet Secretary for NHS Recovery, Health and Social Care, and Richard McCallum, Director of Health and Social Care Finance, Digital and Governance from Scottish Government. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Uh, good morning, uh, convener, and thank you for your invitation to uh, discuss the Scottish Budget with you uh, today and what it means for Scotland's health and social care services. It includes uh, funding of more than £19.5 billion for the continued recovery of the NHS health and social care system. Uh, this budget also provides an uplift which exceeds frontline Barnet consequentials. It means that resource funding for health and social care has more than doubled since 2006-07. Despite uh, this investment, the system is under extreme pressure as a result of the ongoing impact of COVID, Barnet, uh, Brexit uh, and also uh, inflation. And the UK government spending decisions uh, have also resulted in hard choices uh, with greater efficiencies and savings uh, needing to be made. However, investing in Scotland's NHS is non-negotiable for this uh, government. The budget settlement gives our NHS a real terms uplift in the face of UK government austerity. Crucially, it includes more than £14.2 billion pounds for our NHS boards, with an additional investment over half a billion pounds. The budget also supports investment in excess of £10 billion pounds for the NHS pay bill, rewarding our dedicated and skilled NHS staff in recent years. There is more than £2 billion pounds for social care and integration, delivering on our programme for government commitment to increase social care spending by 25 per cent over this Parliament, two years ahead of our original target. It provides an additional £230 million pounds to support the delivery of the pay uplift to a minimum of £12 pounds per hour for adult social care workers in third and private sector from April 2024 representing a 10.1 per cent increase for all eligible workers. And we continue to invest in quality community health services to support our priorities relating to prevention and early intervention. This includes investment of over £2.1 billion for primary care and supporting spending in excess of £1.3 billion for mental health. We will continue to work with partners to address the challenges this settlement brings and to take forward the reforms that is essential for delivering a sustainable health and social care system while delivering quality, high quality services. And of course, I'm happy to respond to any questions that members have. Convener. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. We're going to move straight to questions. Sandwich Gohani. Thank you, Convener, uh, and Declaration of Interest as a practising NHS GP. Uh, good morning, Cabinet Secretary, and thank good you morning. for coming today. Um, so, from your opening statement and from, from um, what we've uh, heard and seen you say previously, um, do you feel you have adequately resourced the Scottish NHS? Um, uh, I don't think you would ever get a Cabinet Secretary for Health who would say they wouldn't want more resource uh, to invest in our health and social care system. I think in light of the very challenging budget settlement which we have, I think we've achieved the best possible outcome we can uh, for the health and social care budget. Um, but notwithstanding that, there will be efficiencies and savings which will have to be made in order to live within the budget settlement which we have and the growing demand which we face as well. So um, I think it's the uh, best uh, uh, outcome we can achieve in very challenging financial circumstances. Uh, however, there will still be continued challenges for the health and social care system, even with this budget settlement. 
Okay, and what would your top three priorities be um, with the budget that you've set out? What are the three things that you would want and expect come the end of our year into next year uh, be? Well, uh, continued investment in uh, our NHS recovery, so including within prevention, so uh, with a, a particular focus on primary care. Uh, also, continued investment in mental health services uh, and to make sure that they are meeting the needs uh, of uh, uh, citizens right across the country. And also, continued investment within social care uh, to ensure that we are doing everything we can to give greater resilience to social care, particularly in recruitment into the workforce that are critical to supporting our NHS. Thank you. So, on those three priorities, um, and in your opening statement, you spoke about mental health. Um, is it not true to say, though, that there is a 1.6% reduction in real terms in your budget for mental health? So the reality is that since what 2000 and there's about 1.3 billion pounds is invested in mental health services, um, of the central funding that comes from the Scottish government, about 290 yeah, million pounds of that it comes from the Scottish government. Um, that's increased. It's almost doubled. It has actually doubled since 2020-21. So, over the course of the last two to three years alone, we have doubled that level of investment, and we've maintained that going forward, despite the difficult financial environment which we're operating in. That has allowed a very significant expansion of mental health services in Scotland, and we want to sustain that and maintain that going forward. So. I think if you look at over the course of the last couple of years, there's been a huge increase in the level of investment we're putting into mental health services. So, I mean, we've seen a significant reduction in mental health across our country. Uh, we've also seen significant increases in CAMS waiting times for our, our children. Uh, the longest wait in Glasgow was 37 weeks uh, for somebody to be seen. So this reduction surely will impact and harm mental health. No, I don't agree with that, and I think it would be fair, unfair to suggest as though that waiting times in CAMS services have not been reduced. There has been a very significant reduction in waiting times for CAMS, particularly the build-up that developed over the course of the pandemic. Staff across our child and adolescent mental health services are working really hard to address these, and we saw some very significant reductions in waiting times. Of course, where there continue to be uh, extended waits, uh, uh, that's not acceptable. That's why work is still being taken forward in order to address that. But I think if anyone looks at the health, the, the mental health budget over the course of the last couple of years, uh, they can't avoid the fact that it has, in some cases, more than doubled, which has allowed for a very significant expansion of services uh, and an increase in capacity in those services which we're now seeing the benefits of in terms of the reductions that we're achieving in CAM services overall. So uh, I recognise that there remains challenges within the delivery of mental health services, uh, but notwithstanding that, very good progress has been made and the sustained increase in investment we've made over the course of the last couple of years is making a difference. And, and um, so in your top three priorities, um, you spoke about NHS recovery in your opening statement as well. Um, so. And, and, and do you feel that you've, you've put a budget in place? So should we expect to see, come next year, uh, uh, at next budget time, significant reductions in improvement in A&E waiting times and significant improvements in waiting times for procedures? Well, let, let's look at where we are in terms of A&E at the present time. Um, so we've seen improvement uh, this year compared to where we were uh, last year. Uh, we're continuing to work with boards in order to help to sustain further improvements going forward. You'll be aware that one of the major challenges that we have around performances around a &E is flow from a &E into the hospital. A significant part of that is caused by delayed discharges. So, Despite the fact that around 98 per cent of all discharges from hospital take place on time, that 2 per cent has a significant impact on flow into the hospital from uh, from our a &E departments. We saw a reduction in the number of uh, delayed discharges at this point this year compared to where we were last year. So one of the things I want to make sure that we're doing in the course of the year going forward is, is very intense work around looking at what more we can do to reduce those delayed discharges, because we know that's a critical part in helping to support the flow into our hospitals. 
A second element of work that we're taking forward is trying to help to reduce the level of demand that we see presenting at our A&E departments. So, for example, just last week, the work that's been taken forward, not just last week, but over the course of this winter, the work that the Scottish Ambulance Service are doing through their integrated clinical hub is reducing the number of people who have to be conveyed to our A&E departments as a result of the investment we're making into that service. So there's work we're doing to help to improve these things, but demand is very significant. But I believe that there's still further progress that we can make, and I'm determined to make sure that over the course of the next year that we will do that and we'll continue to make sure we focus in any areas that we know will help to improve the, the performance that we get in our A&E departments and across our unscheduled healthcare system. So, uh, uh, making progress, but certainly much more to do, uh, and a real determination to make sure we do that. And my, my final question, um, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, we now have regularly over a thousand drug-related deaths, and we <coughs> seem to be going backwards in the care that we give to people with drug dependency. Um, there has been a reduction in real terms in the budget. What is your commitment to that figure and to reducing the number of deaths? And how do you expect people to do that with less money? Well, look, we gave a commitment to increase investment over this parliamentary term of some £250 million pounds into tackling the twin challenges of drug and alcohol uh, misuse, and we are on track to deliver that and to, to sustain that level of investment. Uh, one of the areas that we are keen to see further growth in is around the provision of rehabilitation services, uh, and I know that work has been taken forward in order to uh, achieve that. But the commitment we made to make sure that there was sustained investment in both drug and alcohol services is being taken forward in this budget to make sure that we continue to see the progress that we need to see in the delivery of these services in order to improve outcomes uh, for, for those who, uh, who suffer from uh, drug and alcohol misuse. Uh, and uh, if you look at where we are in terms of funding uh, overall, so in terms of funding in uh, drugs policy has increased by some 67% since 2014-15. So there has been a sustained period of uh, increased investment, but we gave that commitment to making sure that there was a, an additional investment of some £250 million in order to support our drugs and alcohol mission, and that's a commitment that this, this budget builds upon in delivering. Thank you. Emma Harper. Thank you. Thanks, convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning. Good morning, Richard, as well. Good um, I'm interested in uh, just questions about the NRAC formula and the review. Um, for I know it's specifically um, it calculated uh, to help support remote and rural places. So, are you able to give us an update on um, the undertaking of a review of NRAC and timescales, for instance, of when we might expect to have the review in front of us. OK. Um, so in this budget, uh, we have uh, allocated an extra £31 million in order to help to ensure that all boards are within 0.6 per cent of uh, NRAC parity. Um, the largest chunk of that goes to Lothian and, and Fife as part of the £31 million going forward. In terms of the uh, the term for the, the group is the, is the Technical Advisory Group on Resource Allocation, uh, which has met three times uh, uh, so far uh, and is uh, drawing together a, a range of work uh, in order to take forward the, the review of NRAC. I should say that this won't be a quick process. It's uh, any funding formula that has to be uh, changed or developed will take a lot of detailed work. Uh, to be taken forward. I don't know if Richard can say a bit more on, on, on how that work is progressing, uh, but the, uh, the group have already started commissioning the data uh, and information that they require in order to look at how they could adapt the existing in that formula. But I don't know if Richard, you can say a bit more in terms of how it's progressing. Yeah, sure. So um, I, I suppose just two or three things. One, um, First, I think the NRAC formula is still um, valuable in terms of what it's the, 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 the information that it provides for us. And as the Cabinet Secretary has said, 
is a really kind of important um, mechanism by which we allocate funding, given it does take into account, um, you know, a, a wide range of, of both population and, and health factors uh, into the into the um, allocation. Um, the technical accounting group that's looking at this has has, uh, has met, as, as CABSEC has just said, over, uh, three times already, um, and is going to continue that work over the course of, of 2024 to, to, to bring this work uh, forward to, to review for, uh, by the Scottish Government uh, uh, later this year and, and potentially into 2025. The commitment has been for this to be reviewed over the course of this Parliament, and that's what we uh, as officials are certainly committed to doing and so um, as I say over the course of the next year we hope to be in a position to bring forward uh, any uh, changes that there might be but as I say I think even in its current form the NRAC formula has a value and a role to play and it's about making sure that any refinements we make uh, are, are properly uh, reviewed and scrutinised and that's what we'll do. Thanks. Okay I'm just thinking about NRAC just because we're doing a healthcare in inquiry into remote and rural healthcare right now in the committee, so I'm sure it'll help inform us in our inquiry. Thank you. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, talking a little bit more about health boards, uh, I'd be interested to understand what processes are in place. Um, firstly, to do comparisons between health boards, because clearly there are different challenges in different parts of the country, but there's also an awful lot of, uh, of common challenges. So to understand which health boards, if you like, are better um, at performing and more efficient at uh, delivery, and then what mechanisms there are in place for health boards to learn from each other from best in class and, and roll out best practice. Yeah, um, I'll bring Richard in some of the work we do with boards around uh, looking at how we can do shared learning. So we have a, obviously a, 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 a formal monitoring process for all of our boards in terms of performance, not just in terms of key targets, but also around financial uh, management as well. Uh, and uh, we also obviously conduct our annual review process for each of our boards to, to evaluate the progress they're, made, they're making. And there's an in-year uh, uh, review for them as well. Um, I think one of the uh, one of the challenges that's been around a long time, and I recall this when I was previously a junior health minister, was trying to make sure that where there is good practice in one part of the country, that we see that being replicated in other parts of the country. Uh, and it's not a, a challenge which is peculiar to health; it's a it's a, a challenge within the public sector overall. Uh, and it's always a source of frustration to me that for a country of five million people that we struggle at times to make sure that that happens. I mean, good practice is established that it sticks uh, as well. So we have a number of different mechanisms that we, we, we seek to do that through. So one is that we uh, bring our chief executives together on a regular basis where we will focus in in particular areas of challenge and where boards have taken new approaches to share that practice. We do the exact same with chairs. So I meet with the NHS Chair boards, uh, chairs of the boards, um, every six weeks or so, uh, where again we have an opportunity to focus in, in some key areas where there is good practice or challenges in certain areas in order to try to help to uh, encourage that practice. We're also making much greater use of the uh, Centre for Sustainable Delivery, which is based at the Golden Jubilee. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a unit which was established that looks at uh, uh, key areas where there are opportunities for efficiencies and improvement in service delivery and it then takes that forward with individual boards, can model it on the impact it would have on an individual board if they were to deliver this uh, in a different way uh, and it can also go in and do specific work on individual boards as well. So the uh, Centre for Sustainable Delivery I think over the course of the next couple of years will probably be the key mechanism that we'll use to try and get greater consistency and also to make sure we're getting better adoption of good practice uh, where uh, it's been identified and also bringing in new uh, uh, ideals into, uh, into boards. I'll ask Richard maybe to say a bit more on some of the stuff we do around finance uh, with their boards, uh, but there is a whole range of work we try to take forward in, in encouraging uh, the adoption of good practice where it's established in one board in the country. Yeah, so I think I think your challenge in terms of the the different positions across NHS Scotland is a, is the right one because whilst all boards need to make savings and all all boards would would kind of recognise some of the financial challenges that they face, um, you know, not all boards are in the same position financially. And we've you know even if we take last year twenty two twenty three as an example, 
17 boards reached financial balance, five didn't. And so there's a formal mechanism, as the Cabinet Secretary said, where boards haven't been in that position to scrutinise and challenge uh, the issues and um, areas of focus that the board will take forward to address the, the financial challenges that they have. But more broadly, we, we, um, we do work very closely with, with all of the health boards, uh, yes, through the chief execs group, but also through directors of finance and other forums. And I think one of the key things from, from our perspective, we've, we've, we've developed a list of, of almost 15 key areas, and I'd be very happy to share that with the committee. Um, but it takes a range of areas like, for example, effective prescribing and looks at the data from across the country. And, you know, sometimes the variation will be understandable and warranted and there will be good reason for that. Often it won't be. And that's given us a mechanism by which we can, well, firstly, we expect boards to, to look at all 15 areas and assure themselves that they're doing all they can in, 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 in each of those areas but also from a government perspective for us to look at that and, and, and challenge and scrutinise um, where boards might be off track. Another area is in relation to supplementary staffing, and, and I suppose going back to Ms Harper's point, there might be certain parts of the country where it is more necessary and required and needed than, than others, but nonetheless it's important that we can see that, that variation across the country and put that appropriate challenge and scrutiny where, where necessary. Okay, so health board management are well aware of where they sit in those 15 league tables and who's best and who they should be learning from. Oh, yeah, they're very, yeah it's very clear okay. to, Thank to, you. to the system. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Carol Morgan. Thanks, Convener. Good morning. Um, I think my points probably link um, just to what has been said previously by my colleague, and it is around this sort of sustainability of health boards and where we think you, you, you know, you require to work together. Um, you, you noted that there are, um, in my paper said four, but five health boards that are indicating that they're having financial pressures. So in terms of sustainability, you know, what are the key actions that you are working on together? You know, if I was to say what are the three things that you are working on together with the health boards that are on that escalation framework, particularly around stage three? Yeah, so um, we've got a couple of, I think, five health boards that are at stage three just now in terms of the escalation uh, uh, process. I, I think it's maybe just important to emphasise is that the, the providing tailored support to boards which are experiencing um, some specific financial pressures is not new. So this is a mechanism that's been in place and used over the years at various points. So it's not new. Clearly, though, we're in a very challenging financial environment, so we've got boards that are under uh, extra pressure. So a couple of areas that Richard just touched on, I'll, I'll, I'll get him to say a bit more on some of these. So uh, one is around um, staffing in terms of how they, they manage their staffing, the use of uh, agency staff against bank staff uh, and also recruiting staff as well. Um, and the second area is around prescribing uh, as well. There are marked variations in prescribing between different boards and the costs which are associated with that. So where we might essentially procure a lot of these uh, uh, these drugs um, within Scotland, uh, prescribing variations uh, can have an impact. And the Chief Pharmaceutical Officer is doing work around making sure that we do as much as we can to try and get greater consistency of that um, as well, because that again can address issues around cost um, associated with it. Do you want to say a bit more, Richard, on some of the other work that we're taking forward in, in order to help to support around financial sustainability? Yeah, so I think there's, there's um, broadly sort of three or four areas that we're, 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 moking, we're working most closely with boards. And I should just say on the, 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 the five boards I mentioned, that was on the outturn in 22-23. We're obviously still working through uh, the current financial year with, with health boards. Um, but yeah, we've, we, we, we would... I mean, the, the, the major spend areas for, for health boards are obviously in relation to um, uh, workforce and, and medicines. Um, so, so, so they're two key areas that um, you know we, 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 we are taking forward that work. We mentioned the work around supplementary staffing and effective prescribing. That's a, a absolutely key, and, and actually making sure that there's good um, practice in all of those uh, areas where there are opportunities to. Um, switch from, from um, patented drugs to generics and other opportunities like that, then it's really important that there's that clarity in, in terms of how that's taken forward. I think as well as that, it's um, uh, drawing on um, work that can be done by the national boards as well. 
so um, we have um, NSS that takes forward a lot of work on behalf of, of NHS Scotland. And again, if I take the example of, of procurement and actually good practice in procurement, prescribing would be an area where they can support, but there are other areas as well, making sure that where um, there is a national approach to certain services, that that's taken forward and considered and, and all boards are expected to, to, to play into that process and work through that. Um, as well, as indeed are they to, to work with one another to identify best opportunities and best practices. I was uh, just updating Mr McKee. Okay, um, thank you. I've just got a, a couple other points that get raised at the committee um, quite a lot. This one is about the way in which um, settlements are made and sometimes multi funding, you know, like multi-year funding is helpful. Um, we hear that a lot in other sectors, but we have heard this in committee. And how are you pleased to be able to offer that to some of the, the boards? Do you, do you mean as in multi-year budgets? Budget, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sorry, yeah. So, look, I think um, we, we tried um, uh, through our, um, uh, I think it was our, a, a, it was a medium-term uh, financial framework that we published back, was it 2022, where we, sorry? Was yeah, it, it was a spend, yeah, the spending, spending review, review 2022. 2022. We tried yeah. to set out more of an indication over a three-year period. The problem is that we only get an annual budget ourselves, so don't know what next year's budget's going to be. So, uh, so the real challenge is the, the way in which the fiscal environment operates in the UK. We work on an annual basis, which means it's very difficult to give uh, a commitment into what will happen next financial year when you don't even know what your budget's going to be. So, um, but I agree with you. I think the, the, if we could get into a cycle where we were able to provide a much clearer indication over a three-year period. It allows organisations to plan more effectively. It's probably a much more efficient way as well in which to manage services if you've got that certainty. Uh, but the principal challenge we've got in being able to do that is that we were working on an annual budget ourselves, so we don't know what our budget will be the following year, which makes it almost impossible for us to then give commitments into uh, a following financial year, and we don't know what the outlook uh, will be. But I, I agree with the premise and the point that if we could do that, we should do it. Uh, but that would require fiscal change at a, at a UK level in order to give us that type of certainty over a, a three-year period. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I think yeah, you're right. It, 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 it's for, for organisations to be able to predict even that they're likely to have similar or, or ongoing increases in funding. My, my last point really is around the NHS boards and the sort of three three percent recurring savings. You know, like what discussions have you had with the board, if any, around realistically are they? You know, is that sustainable for them? Yeah, well, boards have been expected to make recurring savings for some time now, so would you call it? So it's not new to them. Um, uh, so they're well practised in this. A key part to it is to try and make sure that there is a focus within boards on efficiencies. So we discuss that with boards on a regular basis, both at an executive and non-executive level, to make sure that they are looking at expenditure to uh, achieve efficiencies where they can um, as well. Um, uh, and that's no different in this financial year. Uh, and in some cases, it's, it's more important than ever, given the very tight financial environment which we're operating in. Uh, but I do think it's important, given the level of expenditure that boards have got, which is over £14 billion worth of taxpayers' money, that we do apply targets to them to make sure that they're driving efficiencies in the system where they can. Uh, remember, that's not money that's lost to the system. That's money that's used within healthcare. But it ensures, allows us to make sure that we're getting as much efficiency out of the investment we're making as possible. And I think it's important that boards are given that challenge. Can I, just finally, just one wee bit. Do, do boards indicate if they've reached the the, the sort of point that, that that is becoming more difficult for them, or are they saying to you that they feel that they can continue to to work at that level of three percent? Well, I think I think most boards would say we prefer not not to have to do it if they could. Um, uh, but I think in terms of driving efficiencies in the system, I think it's important that we do set that challenge for them. It's a bit like you know the the four hour wait target. At, you know, A and E. If you were to take that away, actually, I think it would probably cause more problems. It drives some of the system. So I think the three percent is a way of driving them to make sure that they are looking at their expenditure and to see where they can be more efficient um, as well. So. Um, notwithstanding the challenges that go with 
achieving that, I think it's an important challenge that we put to them and we make sure that we hold them to account for that, given the huge amounts of public sector or taxpayers' money that they're responsible for spending each year, that they're doing it as efficiently and as effectively as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you. And Ivan McKee. Yeah, thank you. Um, just to clarify on that 3 per cent recurring savings point, can you unpick what that actually means? Because clearly the budget, in cash terms and in real terms, is increasing to, to health boards. Yeah, we're talking about 3 per cent recurring savings. I'm assuming that's on a kind of like for like and then additional stuff is where the other money is going. But how do you kind of unpick that so we know what that 3 per cent is actually referring to? Yeah, so I mean, in, in, in cash terms, that's probably somewhere around 300 to 400 million to give you an idea of just the, 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 the sort of scale of that. Um, and I think that's just recognising that, that boards, there will be inflationary pressures for boards um, on some of the areas we've, we've already mentioned. If I take um, drugs as an example, we, we know in secondary care the, the inflation that there is around um, uh, uh, drug costs is, 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 is rising you know, at, at a significant rate. So it's important that boards do uh, have a focus, as well as all the additional investment that, that, is, that is provided by the government, that there is that eye to that, that, that savings target as well. So normally, as, in, in, in addition to the half a billion uplift that boards have, have received, um, there would be that expectation that they would be making savings, as I say, 3% somewhere in the region of 300 to 400 million normally. So I'm not really understanding that. You're giving the health boards additional money in cash terms and in real terms every year. Yep. So when you talk about a 3% saving, how does that manifest itself in the numbers? So it's that, an increase, not a saving. Yeah, so we don't take that 3% off them. That's, how do that's you measure? Right. How do you know they're making that saving if they're, you're just giving them more money? So, so we, we, are, we get reports regularly every month on, on board savings and savings plans, but what we, what we, uh, uh, what we um, uh, allow is for that money not to, to be returned to government, but it's retained within the system. So any saving that the board makes, it, they, they keep that within their own system to invest in the, the, the priorities that, that they will have in that system. But, but, but we do have that oversight of where those savings are, are being made. Mm -hmm. OK. You need to be pretty hot on the process and the numbers to make sure that that's all oh, absolutely. along the straight yeah. and narrow, because yeah. it's very really easy to lose the numbers there. Yeah. Oh, uh, you know, the, the clarity of reporting, the areas that boards are focused on, I mean, as I say, that's something that we get regular and detailed reporting on to, to understand. Okay. So the implications of that effectively then are that not only are they getting a 1.7% increase in real terms, they're also getting a 3% increase through those recurring savings, yeah. which is actually an excess of health inflation, effectively. That's correct. So if, yeah. if, 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 you, if you can achieve more of your savings, in a sense, that's better for you because okay. you can invest more locally. Okay, I just want to unpick. Uh, if you look at the, the, the budget, you go down obviously level four uh, is the lowest we go, and it's got health boards individual lines. Just interested to understand a wee bit below that, specifically around about the issue that gets raised from time to time, around about is the health service overmanaged, how much of the money gets spent on bureaucracy, admin, management costs, etc., etc., versus how much is spent on the clinical side um, or on medicines. Um, so, do you have clear visibility? On that, by health board, are those numbers that are that are available for for analysis? Yeah, so we don't publish that at the time of the budget, but um, on a, on an annual basis, there is the NHS cost book, which is which is published for the for the previous year, and that sets out in in detail what's spent across a range of category lines. So the next update um, from Public Health Scotland, who published that data, is going to be in February. And that will set out in, in detail where um, the, the, the total spend that we've set out in the budget, where that is going by uh, in individual line. OK, so we've got visibility on that. I'd be interested yeah. to see that. And just finally on this, um, to what extent are health boards cooperating with each other to look for um, shared services, um, areas where they can combine back office, etc., etc., to take cost out there? So it probably be fair to say it's variable. So there are some boards that have got joint commissioning of services, which um, uh, uh, which they take forward on a um, uh, they take forward on a, a on a plan basis where they think it's in their mutual interest to to do so. We've um, um, 
uh, I've recently we've given them a voluntary option where they can choose to do it if they, they wish to do it. Uh, and there's a mechanism for them to go through if they want to do that. So if it's backroom function stuff, it's like HR stuff, mm -hmm, etc. Mm -hmm, uh, mm -hmm. Doing that on a, a, a shared commissioning basis. Um, uh, I'm moving it to a mandatory basis, okay. so where they're going to be required to do it. Um, uh, there are uh, there are probably a range of boards that could actually be looking at doing more around uh, at sharing some of their backroom functions. Uh, uh, and and we're, we've already indicated to boards that we intend to move that into a, a mandatory space, that it's now required for them to do that. Um, uh, and that will be around things like HR, um, uh, types of payroll aspects that could be uh, that could be managed on a, on a joint basis. Good. Thanks very much. Good. David Torrance. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Secretary. Good morning, Good morning. Richard. Um, how can the twin pressures of increased pay and demands for additional staff be balanced in the NHS and in social care within the constraints of the budgets? So in terms of in health, we could, the, the key to the health service is its staff. So, um, uh, and it's important that we uh, provide them with the financial recognition for the important role they play, uh, which is uh, why we've taken forward the agenda for change commitments that we have given a commitment to in the last financial year. Uh, and also the way in which we've engaged with them around pay negotiations as well. Um, that inevitably creates financial stress in the system and financial challenge for the system as well. But it's critical we do that uh, because they are key to the delivery of our health service. Um, and that will have to be met within the existing budget allocations that have been set out in the 20. 24-25 uh, budget. And in social care, with the additional investment we've put in, uh, which is uh, uh, over £800 million in the last couple of years, a key part of that is helping to address issues of uh, pay uh, within the social care setting, because we know that's a major challenge in recruiting into uh, social care. And we know that the delivery of social care is critical to the performance of our NHS as well. So um, if we want to have a, an effective functioning health and social care system, we need to make sure that we are providing resources where we can to help to uh, uh, pay staff uh, for the uh, important role they have. And that's the approach that we've taken around uh, pay negotiations, uh, both in health and social care and through the Agenda for Change programme. Around higher NHS pay, what effect is that going to have on services if non-staff budgets need to be reduced to fund that increased pay offer? Sorry, I missed the first part of your question there. Um, the increase in NHS pay, what effect will, what effect will that have on um, services if it's to be funded? Staff budgets need to be reduced from um, non-staff um, you know, resources. OK, so uh, we can, you can look at this a, a number of different ways. So um, is that, yeah, it places challenge on, on the budget uh, in paying staff uh, and increasing the pay for staff. Um, but I don't grudge them that at all. So given the important role which they have, that means that some of the other areas of investment they might want to make are not going to be possible uh, because we're, we're increasing the pay uh, for our staff. However, the impact of not paying our staff and not settling these types of issues is also very costly. So both in terms of the financial cost and also the service delivery cost that's associated with them. So if we weren't able to uh, get settlement around some of these pay deals, we would inevitably be facing things like industrial action. And we know that has a very significant financial cost to the NHS. So, uh, for example, if you take the industrial action with junior doctors in England, I think it's estimated that it's uh, cost them, you know, uh, over a billion pounds uh, alone uh, because of all of the additional things you have to put in place to try and cover during the course of industrial action. Alongside that, something like, you know, 1.2 you know, million appointments being cancelled that then has a service delivery impact. So we have to recognise that if we don't invest in our staff and if we don't try to resolve these types of issues in a cooperative fashion, that they can be hugely disruptive and very costly uh, to how the NHS is able to deliver its services. And the approach we have taken is to try to help to resolve these matters. 
uh, in a fair uh, and reasonable way with the employee side. Uh, but of course, that then has a financial impact on wider service delivery, and that you may not be able to expand services in the way in which you would wish to, given the financial environment in which we're operating. Uh, but notwithstanding that, it's, you know, investment in services, is, the way you do that is by investing in your staff. Uh, and I see pay up list for staff as being an investment in our NHS. Thank you. Further questions? Thank you. Uh, Ruth McGuire. Thank you, Convener. Good morning, Cabinet Good morning. Secretary and uh, Richard. I'd like to stick with um, social care budget, please. And forgive me, you did mention some of this in your opening, but I think it's worth getting um, clarity uh, for the record. Can you tell us what the total level of spending on social care planned for 2024-25 is? Um, let us know how that current position compares to what the Scottish Government inherited in 06 07. And can you also tell us how that increase compares to Barnet consequentials received, please? Yeah, I can give. Um, so, the, the total budget for, um, for social care in 2024 25 is um, just over £1 billion. Um, uh, so, if you take from the budget fig figures that I've got here, so um, uh, so if you look at where that was in 2022, 2023, it was 879.6 uh, uh, million pounds. So um, that's a further uh, 200 plus uh, increase, which is a reflection of the additional investment we're putting in to increase uh, pay uh, within social care. I don't think we've got a figure where I can take you back to what we inherited um, here. I would have to come back to you with that, because that goes back to 2006-07 uh, budget. And are you able to tell committee how that increase compares to the Barnet consequentials that the Scottish Government received? Um, I think in terms of, well, in Barnet consequentials, well, you, you can see in terms of in, in the health side, is that there is, a, by and large, I don't think we get a Barnet consequential for social care. Okay. So uh, there's no direct Barnet consequential for that in the way in which there is for health. Okay, okay. It can be a bit challenging to get clarity around the social care budget just because of the way the money flows between government, health and local government. Um, Scottish Government committed to increase spending on social care by 25% over the course of this par parliament. Um, can you remind committee of where, how progress has been made on that? Well, we've already we've already met that target, so we're ahead of schedule on it. So by I think two years, is it right? So um, we're already ahead of it. So it was within this parliamentary term, and it's already been delivered. Um, obviously, you touched on in one of your other answers just the importance of social care in terms of the whole system. I mean, we talk about them separately, but they are intrinsically linked, yeah. particularly you know, from the perspective of patients and good quality services in the community mm. often prevent hospital admissions, particularly unscheduled ones. Can you share with us how the Scottish Government agree, makes decisions about the appropriate balance um, between money going to social care and money going to other areas of health? Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a there's a, there's a couple of different routes that money flows into social care. So there's the funding that we provide to local authorities who will invest in some health boards will invest in social care provision alongside some of the centrally funding, central funding that we provide as well for uh, social care largely around things like um, uh, the pay uplift uh, uh, funding which we're providing. Uh, so the, it, the scale of financial demand in health is markedly different from that of social care. So, obviously, healthcare gets the, the lion's share um, of that. But we have made the very deliberate decision to make sure that we increase investment in social care, and in particular in staff in social care, in order to try to increase its capacity or sustain its capacity, because we know it's under very significant uh, pressure. I think um, one of the things that will be absolutely essential as part of a reform programme for going forward is the ability to deliver a, a national care service where we can ensure there's a greater consistency of approach in how social care is being provided and how that aligns alongside the NHS much more effectively. Because we can see variation across the country which have an impact on uh, how services are 
uh, received by individuals in social care, requiring social care support, and also that impacts on the performance of the NHS as well. So I think um, uh, going forward, we will uh, uh, need to see even further investment in social care, uh, but we'll also need to see service reform, and I think the National Care Service is going to be critical to helping to ensure that we see a much more consistent approach in how social care is delivered and being provided in the country, and how that also aligns much more effectively in helping to work in support of our NHS. Okay. So further investment and also service reform are going to be critical. Um, will that service reform, just as we're, we're thinking about budget, will that make it easier to move bu budgets, to, to move resource from, you know, into the community? <laughs> um, I, I don't know if it will make it, um, it will make it easier. I think what it, what it will give us is, is, is an ability to be much more, much clearer about the outcomes that we're looking to achieve for that investment as well, or for the, the level of public expenditure that goes into social care and to seek to achieve much more consistency. I think for things like staff, there's benefits to it. So, for, for example, around things like collective bargaining, uh, which can, which they can benefit from, which I know is an important issue from the, uh, for trade unions um, as well. So I think in terms of making it a more attractive place for folk to work, I think in trying to get greater consistency of how services are delivered, how that better aligns with the needs of helping to work with their NHS, um, I think the, the creation of a national care service is going to be critical to supporting us achieve that. And also, I think that will help us in being able to get greater consistency of how that funding has been used and to ensure that it's been used to achieve better outcomes uh, for individuals that need to make use of these services in a way that we don't have at the present moment. OK, thank you. Thanks, Governor. Thank you. I'm very aware that there are still many members who haven't had an opportunity to ask any questions yet. Um, I'll come to Sandish Gulfhani for a very brief um, supplementary. Thank you, Convener. Um, Cabinet Secretary, um, we were speaking about the National Care Service, and you've said that there's a billion pounds in the social care budget. Um, so, could you s tell us how much of this budget line relates to the NCS and how much relates to adult social care funding? Uh, it's about £15 million pounds as to the uh, National Care Service. Thank you. Tess White. Thank you, Convener. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. I'd Good like morning. to ask a question about reinforced uh, autoclave aerated concrete, if I may, please. So, sure. it's not clear. Um, exactly how many properties are affected and what the remedial action will be. So are you able to give us an idea of cost uh, based on surveys that have taken place to date and how long the remedial action will take? So over what period? Thank you. So are you not aware of the, what the uh, Health Facilities Scotland have been taking for? I think it was 254. Uh, so, uh, properties that were initially identified in the desktop exercise, they all had their, uh, the, in their original risk assessment, they all had that work carried out before the end of the year with intrusive survey work carried out, and they published the update online on each of those projects. So, is could that, you that share that with us? So, are you aware of the cost and the timescales for remedial action? Yeah, so for, for the vast majority of them, it's 254 were identified as uh, priorities. I think actually only one property actually had to be vacated, and actually it was in the process of being vacated anyway um, on that. Uh, and the others uh, only require. I think the vast majority of them only require additional monitoring. So that, that's all publicly available. So Health Facilities Scotland um, have that on their website. Um, and also each individual health board uh, published information on that as well. What they were doing um, at, once they completed that work, I think, as I previously stated before the end of last year, I think it was at the end of November, that work could be completed, and it was completed on time, is that there were some additional uh, sites that had been identified that weren't previously uh, known. Uh, some of them are not facilities that are directly owned by the NHS, but they may be, for example, GP surgeries, etc., which they were also now taking forward a programme of carrying out survey work for them as well, uh, which I think uh, uh, 
uh, included it was I think it was about an R two an R hundred or so uh, buildings. But that information is all publicly available. Cost? Are you able to put a figure and a timescale for remedial well, action? Well, well, well the, 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 the works didn't identify any so major no remedial, works, remedial works that required other than the normal routine maintenance work that boards would take forward uh, from the work that was carried out last year. So some of that, rather than moving to a survey, rather than a survey being carried out every three years, being carried out every year uh, instead. So, and it details the type of things that they should be taking forward. Some of them, uh, but there was no uh, there was no major costs were identified as part of the survey work that was carried out by Health Facilities Scotland. Okay, just to confirm, no significant costs and no uh, significant remedial action. There was no there was no significant uh, works and the, the, there was no major disruption to services as well. So, in a few areas where there was work needed, it was part of the normal routine maintenance work. Good, thank you. Um, a second question. So. It, this, this relates to the capital investment uh, budget. So in, in recent years, the design and delivery of hospital infrastructure projects was beset, unfortunately, with delay, overspend, and, and sadly an unthinkable tragedy, as we saw in Queen Elizabeth Hospital in Glasgow. So I'm just looking at um, NHS Grampian, and NHS Grampian has conceded that there are serious issues, as, as we've um, discussed before with the design of water systems and ventilation uh, for the Baird Family Hospital and the Anchor Centre. And that has created and does create a significant pressure on the project budget. Um, and it's very difficult, and they've shared as well, it's very difficult for them to actually quantify the financial Im impact of that. So my question, Cabinet Secretary, is can you confirm um, what headroom, if any, is available within the latest project capital investment budget for the Baird and Anchor projects um, in order for them to reach completion? So has that been, has that been factored into the budget? Thank you. So the, um, uh, the capital budget um, for the Baird and Anchor is what was originally agreed. So, uh, within the overall project. So, no extra money? There's no additional capital. Our, our capital budget's been cut by the UK government by, you know, nearly 11%. So, or sorry, 10%. So, um, uh, so in construction costs for projects that are already in delivery have also increased as well. So, um, uh, we're trying to use that as fairly and as reasonable as we can, but there is. Um, there's no additional capital available um, because of the cut we've experienced uh, uh, alongside the, 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 the construction inflation that projects are facing as well. So you, you see, Cabinet Secretary, you, you can imagine that's that will be extremely worrying that if a hospital has got major design flaws and there's no extra money coming, that, that there, there are serious questions about delays to completion. Um, obviously, it's a Grampian project, and they're taking it forward as a, as a board. Um, we'll provide them, as we do through NHS Assure, with as much support and assistance as we can um, to make sure they get these things right um, uh, and that they address any uh, uh, any changes which have to be have to be made. But there is no, I'm afraid, there's no additional headroom within the capital budget, given the given the cut that we've experienced from the UK government to our capital budget and the direct impact that then has on capital projects right across not just health but right across the Scottish Government and uh, any additional costs will have to be met within the project cost overall. So you're in control of the budget and you're blaming the UK Government? No, because we get, our capital budget is dependent on the capital allocation we get from the UK Government. They've cut our capital budget by 10%. No further questions, so, thank you. So the consequence of that is that there is less capital funding available for investing in capital projects in Scotland. On top of that, we're also experiencing very significant challenges around construction inflation. So some projects in some cases have almost doubled in cost um, as a result of construction inflation, which has been experienced over the course of the last year to 18 months as well. So you've not only got increased costs for projects, you've also got, as a result of the UK Government's decision to cut our capital budget, less money to invest in capital projects. That's a direct consequence of a decision that's been made by the UK Government to cut our capital budget. 
Gillian Mackay. Thanks, Convener. Morning, Cabinet Secretary. Um, preventative spend is often difficult to track and quantify, particularly when once it goes into um, health board budgets, as well as the health benefits from preventative spend often taking a long time to show up in population health data. How does the Scottish Government track and evaluate preventative spend? And does the Cabinet Secretary believe that that data needs to be improved to further target preventative spend? So there's a, a number of different ways in terms of uh, we try to uh, invest in preventive spend. So uh, normally around uh, behavioural change programmes, whether it be around alcohol and drug use or um, uh, uh, eating habits, etc., uh, smoking, all of which are all about preventing, trying to reduce a, a, to reduce some of the health consequences that we experience um, as a result of um, uh, these challenges. So we do that. A lot of that is done through marketing campaigns, also service delivery programmes that we fund NHS boards for. Many of them will have targets and what they're set for, for example, on smoking cessation programmes and the number of people that they should be seeking to uh, reduce. So we're able to monitor the progress that they make against uh, these types of targets. We also invest in areas, uh, for example, uh, um, we're taking forward some, prevent uh, for example, new innovations uh, that we're taking forward. Uh, for example, around type 2 diabetes remission and also type 2 diabetes prevention programmes, the digital dermatology programme, vaccination programme, lung cancer AI. Um, all of these are programmes that we use in order to, to try to help to uh, 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 do more in the preventative space uh, uh, through use of innovation. How do we identify some of these things that we take forward? We've got a programme called ANU, which is headed up uh, with, in partnership with the Chief Scientific Officer to identify areas for investment in preventive spend that we know going forward that will have a significant impact in helping to improve outcomes. Uh, and we do that as a Wins for Scotland approach to identify what's the most appropriate areas for a, a investment in new technologies um, in NHS Scotland to support preventive spend. Uh, and we're able to evaluate those programmes as they are rolled out uh, and as those investments are made as well. So that combination of the programmes that we run, that we evaluate through health boards for things like uh, preventive health care issues, uh, uh, alongside the ANYA programme is targeting new innovations that we know can help to prevent ill health uh, and improve outcomes for individuals. And we evaluate what's the most effective route in which to make those investments and evaluate their impact as well. That's great, thank you. A shift to preventative spend is sometimes difficult to do when there is acute need within the system. And I was pleased that through the budget, the um, consultation on a public health supplement has been proposed, which is something my party have long backed. Does the Cabinet Secretary believe that measures such as these could help to drive preventative spend? Yeah, I think so. You know, I, I know there's always an ambition to uh, invest much more within uh, preventive health care where we can. And uh, that's challenging when you're in a, a very difficult financial environment uh, and given the very significant demand that services are facing as well. Uh, but notwithstanding that, where we've got the opportunity to do so, we should. Uh, and I think we've committed to exploring the issue around the public health levy um, uh, uh, over the course of the next year, which I think would provide an opportunity, if it was agreed, for it to be introduced to see investment into other areas of preventive spend as well. I think we should also recognise that new innovation and technology can play quite an important part in some of the preventative approaches that we take forward. So, as I mentioned, around some of the diabetes work that we can do, uh, that some of that new digital technology that we can use uh, could have a real impact in helping to reduce some of the other uh, 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 side effects that people can experience as a result of diabetes and helping them to live healthier. And we know that will then have a preventive spend in the future because of uh, the benefits that come from that. We know things like using things like AI and, uh, and radiography can help to identify issues at an earlier stage as well earlier intervention, uh, which would reduce further expenditure in the future. So um, I think technology and new innovation can play a really important part in helping to make sure that we're doing more in the preventive space and any additional investment that comes through a public health levy uh, uh, in, in future years to support that would be very welcome. 
And the Cabinet Secretary and I have had many conversations about um, vaping and the impact on, on health. And given how quickly novel products can affect health, what impact does this have on preventative spend budgets? And is the way we allocate these budgets flexible enough to adapt if novel products have an impact on health um, in the year? So, um, uh, I'm not too sure whether we've got enough flexibility in it because it goes back to a point that, we, that Carol Monaghan was making as well, which was around some of the challenge we have around giving organisations budgets to take forward programmes over the course of a year that then has to be adapted and changed in year when we will learn new information about something that's coming onto the market. So um, I think maybe we should be think more about, I'll have to think more where there's more we could do to allow some flexibility in that. But for example, around vaping, we've saw over the course of the last number of years now how that's a sector that has just uh, uh, growing exponentially to quite a marked degree and uh, it has there's not just health issues there's environmental consequences that go with that and the need for stricter regulation around these issues and we've obviously got the joint consultation which we're taking forward just now with the other four nations uh, in order to look at what further restrictions we should be put in place so uh, there's no doubt in, mind, in my mind that there is a need for uh, for proactive action on the part of government here in a preventative space um, uh, and uh, I think there is a, uh, uh, I'll take away the point around flexibility in year, but I'm just conscious of some of the challenges we have and the way in which we fund the organisations uh, if we were to look for them to adapt that in the course of a financial year. That's great. Thanks, Convener. And Emma Harper. Thanks, Convener. Just to pick up on what, what, um, what Gillian Mackay is asking about preventative spending, the diabetes-related stuff, in the last session of Parliament, you know, I was interested to find that you know, if we invest more in prevention, um, you know, we would then mitigate a lot of NHS spend, like we spend £772 million on um, obesity-related conditions in the NHS. And so if we can upfront prevent type 2 diabetes or reverse it or help manage weight loss. So, and I'm, I'm looking at the budget for Public Health Scotland. It's, uh, it was 56.3 million last time and 57.5 million is what's proposed for this year. So that's an increase. And Public Health Scotland are, um, are doing, currently doing a whole systems approach to diet and healthy weight. But it's not just the health budget that's impacted because social care, are, uh, like a social care budget, is looking at tackling poverty, which is part of what leads to um, poor diet, for instance. So is there work that is taken forward or happening where it's not just specific in one portfolio, that other portfolios help inform what action is being taken forward, for instance? So what I'm suggesting is that it's not just up to the health budget to manage some of the challenges that we have in tackling poverty and managing weight. There's other portfolios that help support that as well. So I think if you um, if you look at the issue of some of the consequences of um, a, a lifestyle that that result in ill health, um, it's very often NHS that's dealing with the consequences of these. Um, but there are other services that could do more to help to prevent these issues from arising. So. Uh, the investment we're making in areas such as, for example, in early years, in my view, is absolutely critical in helping to improve the outcomes for children. Uh, evidence shows that. We can see that internationally is that early years intervention um, is much more effective in helping to improve the outcomes for uh, for children and young people, um, not just when they are children and young, but in later life as well. Uh, investments in issues tackling child poverty, so through child. Uh, uh, Scottish Child Payment are examples that will help to reduce some of the uh, risks that are associated with child poverty that can have an impact on an individual's health and their uh, long-term well-being. Uh, the Best Start programme, again, are all measures, that some of which are health, but some of which are in other portfolio areas, that can have an impact in helping to, uh, to improve uh, uh, some of the health outcomes that we have in the future. 
Having said all of that, um, you know, if you do look at the disease tree, if you look at something like, you know, if you look at something like obesity, and all of the different branches that come off that, from you know, cardiovascular through to respiratory, through to uh, through to um, uh, diabetes, and all of the consequent things that come from that, neuropathies, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, if you tackle some of the root areas much more effectively, you can help to head off some of the other consequent health complications that come from these conditions. So. I suspect that you know you probably recognise that tackling things like obesity is one of the critical areas that can help to reduce demand on cardiovascular diabetes, some of the respiratory issues, and everything that can go with that, uh, uh, which would have a preventative benefit in the future. In saying all of that, um, the biggest risk that we have to trying to tackle some of these challenges, I think, particularly around health inequalities that we're experiencing, is that. You know, the two key areas are moving in the wrong direction. Mortality rates are increasing and health inequalities are widening. They have been for over a decade now, largely as a result of austerity. So you can see all the evidence demonstrates that. So uh, that as you reduce the social protection uh, system, then the impact that then has on increasing mortality rates and uh, increasing inequalities gets greater. And we've been going through that over the course of the last 10 years, which is why that data is going in the wrong direction. There are certain things you can do to try to help to mitigate some of that, but there is very clear to me is that the austerity we've had for over 10 years and the austerity which we're experiencing at an even greater level just now will result in people dying prematurely uh, because of the impact that will have on the social protections that people are dependent upon it reducing. Uh, and uh, I believe that's probably one of the biggest public health challenges which we face going forward. So if there's one thing I would do to try to help to tackle some of the health inequalities and the consequent problems that go with it, it would be about tackling economic policy around austerity, which would have the biggest impact in helping to reduce some of the very marked inequalities which have been expanding over recent years. Okay, thanks. And I forgot to remind everybody I'm a registered nurse uh, with the NMC. I should have said that at the beginning. Thanks. Thank you. Paul Sweeney. Thank you. Thanks, Cabinet Secretary, Mr McCallum, for, for coming in today. just wanted to come back on um, the detail of mental health expenditure in particular. It's the government's long-standing target to achieve a 10 per cent frontline NHS expenditure on mental health services by the end of this Parliament. Current allocation is sits at around 8.8 per .8%. Um, which represents an uh, actual expenditure shortfall of £1.8 million. Could the Cabinet Secretary please talk through how he intends to achieve the target by the end of the Parliament under the current curve? So you're right, yes, so it's about 8.8 per cent um, of, uh, of our expenditure at the present moment. Um, uh, I, I hope by the end of this parliamentary session we'll have it at 10 per cent. Uh, that will be dependent upon future budgets and availability of finance to do that. Um, it, it would certainly be our intention to do so. Uh, but as I mentioned earlier on, there has been a very significant uplift in mental health expenditure since 2020-2021, uh, where uh, we have increased our level of investment, more than doubled um, in terms of Scottish Government uh, investment in this area. So, uh, it's still our ambition. Uh, we're at 8.8 per cent, and uh, we need to look at whether budgets in future years are going to be able to allow us to continue that increase to achieve the 10 per cent. The current actually highlights the, the longer term increase in mental health expenditure. The target was set by the government of 10 per cent, and it has stalled. It's certainly stalling this year, um, and it's going backwards in real terms. Um, do you view that as a high risk um, of a, not achieving this target? Is this an area where you've got a kind of red flag against that particular target and saying that's something we're going to be challenged to achieve by the end of the Parliament? It's a reflection of a really difficult public financial environment which we're operating in. So where we're not able to make all of the increases that we would like to do so, um, we have, as I mentioned, made a very significant increase over the course of the last couple of years, but sustaining that going forward in the present financial environment is really challenging. Um, uh, uh, so we've sought to protect it uh, as best we can uh, uh, in order to sustain the investment we've made over the significant increase in investment over the next or the last couple of years. Uh, but whether we'll be able to increase that further is going to be dependent on budgets in future years and at this stage, you know, I can't you know, if if, if the present approach to public finances continues, it's going to be really challenging to do that, okay. uh, given the, the pressures on public sector budgets right across government. Okay. There's an 
area of particular concern, obviously highlighting the, it was mentioned earlier, the, the, the real terms cut to drug and alcohol budgets. I think it's down 1.6% uh, this coming financial year. That represents a real cut of £100,000 or so. It might seem quite minor, but it is having a direct effect, for example, on the proposed closure of the two, uh, Turning Point 218 service in Glasgow next month. Um, due to the funding settlement from the integrated joint board in Glasgow um, of just £650,000 down from £1.3 million. That was described by Turning Point as unworkable, thus it's closing down, potentially affecting um, you know, the, the impact on women's mental health recovery. Um, people are suffering from addiction issues, um, potentially also interacting with the justice system. Also, cognizant of preventative spending need to rehabilitate people. Um, would the Cabinet Secretary consider engaging directly with the Glasgow City Council and, and the Health and Social Care Partnership there to find a way to potentially salvage this service, which could potentially have a big impact uh, on the healthcare budget? I know it interacts with justice, um, but it does have a cross-cutting effect on healthcare as well. Um, yeah, I, 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 think, I think the 218 service, I think it, that, that came through as a justice it funding that actually went into IJBs, it wasn't health funding mm -hmm. on that. So I'm not I'm not entirely sighted on exactly what's happened with the justice funding. I think that would probably go back to the old um, uh, justice boards uh, and funding that was transferred across to IGB, rather than it being directly from the health portfolio mm -hmm. uh, in itself. I, you know, I, I'd imagine it's a matter that the justice secretary would be able to respond to. Uh, on it because it's not something that sits directly within within my portfolio. That's a fair point, but would you, perhaps as a stakeholder with clear impacts on the healthcare system, uh, potentially make representations and to find a way through this um, with your colleague? Well, I, I'm more than happy to ask the justice secretary to respond to the issues that you've raised, given that it's a it's a it's a it's a justice-led area rather okay. than being a health-specific area um, on that. But I, you know, we made a commitment to invest. An extra two hundred and fifty million pounds in uh, the twenty areas of drug and alcohol uh, services over the course of this parliamentary term, and we're we're on track to achieve that. So that is a, an increase in investment over the course of mm. the last couple of years, and we want to try and help to make sure that we we continue to make progress with that. It is obviously down to local partners yeah. to determine how they think those that those that funding should best be delivered at a local level. So. Mm -hmm. But some of the services that might read into things around alcohol and drugs issues, some of them are not funded by directly by the health portfolio. Mm. They sit in other portfolio areas. But more than happy to ask mm. the Justice Secretary if she could respond to the, the issue of concern you've raised about the right. 218 centre. That's very kind. Um, also, just a quick one. Um, it's been raised by um, NHS staff in Glasgow around safe staffing levels. Is this something that you keep monitoring um, where there are potentially dangerous levels of understaffing and target resource expenditure to make sure that at least there's a minimum safe staffing level across the healthcare system, particularly in the acute hospitals? Yeah, well, yeah. We, don't, we don't micromanage you know, services directly on the ground um, uh, within individual health boards, but clearly there's a requirement for boards to make sure that there are staff, safe staffing levels being provided. Where there are concerns, there's a mechanism for staff to raise that and to escalate it to through the board. We've obviously got the legislation uh, which we are taking forward. There's a lot of work going on around uh, the safe staffing legislation uh, which we that we have introduced. But I'd certainly if there are concerns that have been raised with, with you directly by staff that they, they should escalate that through the local mechanism to make sure that that's addressed because my expectation would be is that boards would address that and, they would dread, and I would expect them to address it quickly as well. Okay. So just to confirm that that's not something that would necessarily be escalated to your directorate or your, your department directly, it would be something to be contained at a board level um, in terms of flagging up potentially dangerous staffing levels. I'm just curious as to how that would be escalated up the chain. It's a, it, it, well, it's an operational issue, so I would right. expect it to be dealt with by boards. So they've got okay. a whole executive team. So yeah. I would expect if there was an issue around, say, staffing within a particular ward, I would expect that to be escalated through their local management structure. Um, uh, eventually, I presume, to the director of nursing, uh, and if necessary, then to, through to the chief executive on that. If there was a, a wider systemic problem mm. that was being experienced in a board, uh, and it has been brought to the attention, we would certainly want to raise that with a board. But in terms of day-to-day -day operations, it would be a matter that's the responsibility of the individual board to, okay. to deal with. But if a, so say a wider systemic issue, I would certainly be concerned about that, and mm. I would want to take action around that if there was a problem on a board. That's great. Much appreciated. Thank you.
Thank you. Um, can I thank uh, the Cabinet Secretary and uh, Richard McCallum for joining us this morning? And I will briefly suspend the meeting to allow for a change of witnesses for the next agenda item. Okay.
Our third item of business today is consideration of an affirmative instrument, Anaesthesia Associates and Physician Associates Order 2024. The purpose of this instrument is to allow the statutory regulation of Anaesthesia Associates and Physician Associates by the General Medical Council. It provides a framework for AA and PA regulation and establishes the powers and duties in relation to the GMC, including the autonomy to set out the detail of its regulatory procedures in its rules. The Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee considered this instrument at its meeting on 9 January 2024 and made no recommendations in relation to this instrument. We will have an evidence session with the Cabinet Secretary for NHS Recovery, Health and Social Care and supporting officials on the instrument. Once we have had all our questions answered, we will proceed to a formal debate on the motion. And I welcome to the committee Michael Matheson, Cabinet Secretary for NHS Recovery, Health and Social Care, Rachel Coots, Scottish Government Legal Director at Food, Health and Social Care, Nigel Robinson, Unit Head, Professional Health Regulation uh, Chief Nursing Officers Directorate, and Scott Wood, Unit Head, Sponsorship and Infrastructure, Health Workforce Directorate, all from Scottish Government. And I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make a brief opening statement. Uh, thank you, Convener. This statutory instrument is first and foremost about patient safety. Safe, effective and person-centred practice is the driving force behind how we deliver healthcare in Scotland. And patients have a right to know that they are being cared for by professionals with the appropriate level of assurance and accountability. Convener, these roles have been practising across the UK for 20 years now, and we cannot delay the regulation any longer. With numbers and skills continuing to grow, we must introduce consistent UK-wide standards supported by meaningful sanctions when those are not met. This is also a significant stride in the road to meaningful reform of the regulation of health professionals, something I know that several of us around the table today will appreciate. In bringing these uh, devolved professions into statutory regulation, this order also brings the General Medical Council within the competence of the Parliament and therefore this committee for the first time. The regulatory landscape is complex and unwieldy, with each regulator operating within their own legislative framework. There is too much inconsistency and bureaucracy, which restricts the ability to swiftly adapt to the evolving demands on our health services without recourse to legislation. Convener, this order is the culmination of years of collaborative working between the four governments of the United Kingdom and multiple public consultations. As such, it is the first step towards a modern, more modern and flexible model of regulation, establishing the first generation of a framework that will ultimately apply consistently across the health professions. It requires the GMC to set up a register and to put in place processes around education and training, fitness to practice, offences and appeals for these roles. However, I must acknowledge the pejorative commentary around these roles in recent weeks, both across both social and mainstream media. This relentless negativity has been detrimental to our physician associates and anaesthesia associates, and I hope that this statutory regulation will promote respect for their contribution to our healthcare system. It is important to note that while each of the governments agree that regulation is necessary, decisions on their utilisation within NHS Scotland will be taken by Scottish ministers and based on what is best for the people of Scotland. Our wider approach to the development of this workforce will be informed by our newly established MAPS implementation programme and overseen by a programme board made up of a range of key partners. We expect that board to meet for the first time next month. Thank you, Convener. Of course, I'm happy to respond to any questions the committee may have. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary, for that opening statement. And before I begin, can I um, refer members to my register of interest and in that I hold a bank staff nurse contract with Greater Glasgow and Clyde NHS, and I'm a registered mental health nurse registered with the NMC. Um, am I correct in thinking that these regulations follow on from a 2019 agreement with UK 
the Department of Health and Social Care, um, along with discussions with all the other devolved health departments, about the, uh, the GMC taking on this role of regulation of PAs and AAs? Yeah, it's part of a, 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 a long-standing piece of work we've been taking forward with the, with the uh, UK government. And back in 2019, the then Cabinet Secretary for Health and Sport signalled uh, agreement with the UK government that we should uh, bring forward legislation to regulate both AAs and uh, uh, PAs. Uh, however, uh, there were issues around the wider uh, regulatory framework, which was part of that discussion, which was about carrying out quite a significant review of the regulation of healthcare professionals. And it was then viewed that actually trying to do it all at the one time uh, was not going to be effective. It was too complex. And the decision was made to take the PA and AA aspect of regulation separately, while the wider piece of work around health regulation uh, was being uh, considered separately. So that's a separate piece of work. Uh, which is why this has been brought forward as a standalone order. Th thank you for that clarification. Um, and, and I welcome um, your statement in, with regards to some of the commentary that there has been on healthcare professionals working as AAs and PAs. Can I ask the, the Cabinet Secretary how he responds to some of the claims that, uh, implo um, that having the GMC as regulator will add to confusion between doctors and PAs and AAs and how that can be mitigated? Um, I, I've heard some of the commentary around this. Um, I, 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 I don't subscribe to it. So we have a, a range of different health regulators that uh, regulate a range of different professional groups. So. Um, uh, so the idea of the GMC being able to take on the regulation of uh, PAs and AAs, in, in my view, I don't think will cause any any confusion so long as there is a very clear regulatory body responsible for dealing with any issues relating to uh, uh, PAs and AAs. So I, um, I, I, I've heard some of the commentary, but I'm not persuaded by it, given mm -hmm. the fact that we've got a range of uh, uh, other... Uh, uh, regulators that cover other professional groups, uh, and on my basis, uh, I don't see why that would be any different, why it would create any confusion for the GMC, given that it doesn't for other uh, health regulators. Okay. And, and can I ask um, if the Cabinet Secretary considered making the Health and Care Professionals Council, the HSPC, a regulator for PAs and AAs, if there was any consideration given to that, and why you decided that actually the regulation with GMC, as other parts of the UK have, have done, would be more appropriate? Yeah, there was a, there was a consultation exercise on uh, which regulatory body, or part of that was which regulatory body would be most appropriate for the regulation of them. Um, and the, uh, a very significant majority of those that responded to the consultation said it was the GMC mm -hmm. uh, would be the most appropriate body to carry out that regulatory function. So the order is reflective of the, uh, the feedback, which is under 60%, if I recall correctly, uh, uh, it believed that it should be the GMC should be responsible for the regulation in this area. Uh, and therefore, the order uh, and approach has been taken by both the Scottish and UK governments is reflective of the feedback we received from that consultation exercise. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. That's very helpful. Sanders Gohani. Thank you. Uh, and just to clear my register of interest as a practising NHS GP, uh, Cabinet Secretary, look, I do agree with the expansion of the multidisciplinary team. We do need to ensure that we have appropriate staff. Um, but I am concerned about physicians, associates, and anaesthetic associates. And so um, a number of concerns. My first is about confusion. And, and so why has the name changed from physician's assistant in 2003 to physician's associates in 2014? And why are we sticking with physician's associates? Um, I'll maybe ask Nigel, in terms of the history to back in 2003, and why there was a change in, in, in the name at that particular point. I think it's important to note that a uh, physician associate as a role uh, arrived from America uh, around about 20 years ago. Uh, they were, they've been established for quite some time, uh, notably in NHS Grampian in partnership with Aberdeen University's course. Uh, these courses have been running for that duration. Uh, so we have a cohort of practitioners in place already who have, they have attained accredited qualifications using that title. Uh, and there are currently courses running using that title. Uh, so 
there would be significant problems in retrospectively changing it, and uh, we believe that that would result in uh, unacceptable delays to the further uh, legislation to bring them into statutory regulation, which is absolutely necessary for patient safety. Sorry. They're not regulated currently, so if you're creating legislation, you can put any name you want. We could, but not with this legislation. This legislation would have to fall in this Parliament and in the UK Parliament, and the whole process would have to start again. Uh, we're in, uh, it looks like we're going to be in a UK election year, so we would have no guarantee when we would actually be able to bring these, these uh, roles into statutory regulation. Okay. And one of the things the BMA is telling us uh, is that patients and their families are unaware uh, in a lot of times uh, whether they've been assessed by a doctor uh, or not. So following on from the, the question from the convener, um, seeing as the GMT regulate doctors, getting them to regulate somebody else, wouldn't that then add to that confusion? I, I, I've heard this argument a few times. I, I don't quite follow it. So there are, there are other uh, professional regulatory bodies, for example, around pharmacy, etc., that actually cover not pharmacists. They cover other uh, groups that are supplementary to pharmacy as well. I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't follow this argument that in some way that by the GMC taking on the role of regulating uh, PAs and AAs in some ways uh, will cause public confusion around the role of the GMC. You know, if you've got a complaint to make about um, a PA or uh, 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 you know, an A or a doctor and the regulator is the GMC that's responsible for doing that, then you'll take the complaint to them. Um, I don't understand this. I, I, I don't follow this argument that for some reason that the GMC, for some peculiar reason, it will all become really confusing if they regulate two other groups other than just doctors given that other regulatory bodies do that, and it doesn't appear to cause any difficulty for the public in pursuing a complaint or pursuing an issue with the relevant regulatory body. OK, and, and so can we talk about money? The cost of regulating a, a PA will be half of that of the cost of regulating a doctor, and the government is putting money in to subsidise uh, this regulation process. Is that fair? Yeah, I think the process here is initially is to get the eventually it'll be a self-funding model which will operate, but this is a, a, a measure which will be for the initial couple of years, in order to get the the regulatory process up and running, uh, and as that workforce expands, then it will be a self-funding model in the way in which most of the regulators now operate anyway. So, yeah, this is part of the, of the initial process to support the GMC in, in taking on this regulatory role. And in the cost of half of what it would cost to regulate a doctor? Um, I don't know what the exact costs are um, associated with that for, for individuals. Yeah, I don't know what it is, but it's the, the UK government have taken the decision that uh, that they'll fund the GMC to support the GMC in the introduction of regulation around this and the, and the regulation of PAs and AAs. But eventually it will move to the normal self-funding model that all the I think all of the regulators more or less operate to if not the majority of them. OK, and if you're going to regulate, um, you need to have very tight definitions of what it is the profession is doing. That you know, There's very tight definitions about nursing, about mm -hmm. expanded roles, about what doctor does. Um, so with the scope of practice of uh, an AA and a, uh, a PA, 69% of respondents to a BMA survey said they were concerned um, that there had indeed been uh, uh, this expansion in the role to where it where the, it really shouldn't be. And an example would be, um, I've heard of the MedReg bleep, which is one of the most senior uh, positions in a hospital, um, being held by a physician's associate. Um, what is the scope of practice for a PA when it comes to the complaints procedure and that regulation? <coughs> So, well, they're unregulated at the present moment. So, and the way in which we deal with them in Scotland, where we have a very small cohort of them, around 150, uh, operating within the NHS, is that we uh, issued direction back in 2016 um, around the type of role and the scope of a role 
uh, within NHS Scotland. So that's already defined clearly um, as the GMC take on the regulatory function. They'll be responsible for setting out these definitions and the terms of those definitions as well going forward. Now, GMC have said that is not their role. Well, and and in, your, in the, the, the work that you put out, you haven't defined what supervision means. Uh, so, in terms of uh, how we then use them within NHS Scotland will be determined by us, and that will be the approach that we'll take through the <laughs> group that I've said to that we've set up that will consider their role going forward. We've taken a very different approach, uh, which is part of, I think, the concerns that the BME have flagged from the UK government in this matter, where the use of PAs and As are a key part of their workforce plan going forward, and the very the proposed fairly rapid expansion of their use has raised a lot of concerns, and I understand that, which is why we've taken a different approach here in Scotland, and I've already outlined to the BMA is that we're going to take much more of an incremental, and it will very much be an evidence-based approach as to how PAs and AAs will be used within NHS Scotland, and how they will be deployed within the NHS Scotland workforce, and how they'll be utilised. And that's exactly part of the process that we put in place in order to manage that. So we are not intending to replicate the very rapid expanded use that the UK government are applying within NHS England. We are taking a much more evidence-based and a much more limited approach to how they will be used and how that will be defined. So can I just be clear that you said you would have a... Are you doing work into that? Is that um, a, a programme you're setting up? Yeah, I mentioned it in my opening comments. So, what do you call? Um, we've set up, uh, set up the the maps implementation program uh, group, which is a is a program board, and that's got key partners on it. So, from within NHS Scotland, Royal Colleges uh, uh, are involved in that uh, in order to make sure that we've got a very clear implementation process for the use of PAs and AS as they go forward as a regulated body, and how they will be deployed and used within. Uh, NHS Scotland. And I've also set out very clearly to the BME the difference in the approach that we are taking with the UK government. Because I think a lot of the concerns that the UK government, or sorry, the, the BME have around it is the way in which the UK government have taken issue of regulation around PAs and As, and also how they've set it out within their workforce plan, which has conflated two issues. Uh, and the approach we're taking here in Scotland is a different one. It'll be much more evidence based, it'll be much more managed, and it will also be very clearly defined in the role and the way in which they will be used within NHS Scotland. Thank you. Uh, Carol Morgan. Thank you, uh, Convener. Um, it's uh, just quite a, a sort of, perhaps more a, a, a sort of statement, but um, I might, I obviously I totally agree in terms of regulation. It's really, really important. Um, I should declare I was on the uh, Healthcare Professions Council but about 15 years ago, um, and they have a very diverse group of professionals, and they're quite used to this sort of advanced role. So I'm just interested to know, was there a debate about whether they sat neatly on the GMC or the H? CPC, um, because they are obviously very skilled in that sort of diverse uh, role with these advanced um, practices as well. Yeah, the, just going back to the answer I gave earlier on, there was, there was a debate around it, and it was part of the consultation that was carried out, uh, where we asked for feedback on which body would be the most appropriate to, to regulate PAs and AAs, and the uh, very clear majority, just under 60%, uh, said it should be the GMC, should be responsible for doing that. Uh, uh, the GMC have also been very clear, and they believe that they're capable of actually carrying out that regulatory function as well, and have already been putting in place arrangements to, to manage that uh, process. I think they gave evidence to the committee, and we've met with them and discussed that matter with them as well. So. Um, I've got, you know, I, I, you know, I used to be regulated by, uh, you know, the, the the Healthcare Professions Council, and and you know, it's it regulates a whole range of bodies, uh, different professional groups or idea, and I don't think that it causes any confusion for no. the public. So I think the idea of an our regulator taking on uh, a bit of additional regulatory work, I don't think causes great difficulty for the public to be able to understand. Yeah. It, it, no, I mean, it, it's not that I, I disagree. It was just of interest to know with that sort of diverse group already being as a, you know, a whole regulatory body, um, if it made sense for them to go there, is, I suppose, was my, was my question. Yeah. Okay. 
Thanks, convener. I am going to declare an interest as well as a registered nurse, and I worked with um, physicians assistants and um, and physicians now physician associates uh, when I worked in a level one trauma centre in California, including anaesthesia as well. So, um, so I'm, I've been interested in following this, and I've looked a little bit at the like American perspective where. In May 2021, the House of Delegates passed a resolution to, to formally name physicians' associates as associates. And, um, and I know there are issues where there's concerns where during the training of physicians' associates or anaesthesia associates that it might impede the ability of um, junior doctors to find uh, time in for their training as well. Has that something that's been considered so that uh, we can allay, um, I guess, concerns that might impact the training of our junior doctors? Yeah, look, I think that's a very legitimate concern to be raised, which is why, um, uh, as I mentioned to Dr Gohani, the, 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 the measured approach that we are taking and the evidence-based approach we are taking to the use of PAs and is going forward as well, and where they will sit within NHS Scotland and our workforce development going forward. Uh, Scott Wood can say a wee bit more about that, because it is important that we make sure that the important training environment for our junior doctors is not compromised as a result of this. But I believe that can all be managed if we do that in a proper programmed way, uh, with a very clear uh, a, a sense of where we see the role of PAs and A's and where they can help to add value. Uh, to our, our healthcare system. Scott, do you want to say a bit more about that? Of course. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. So, um, ultimately, uh, investing in the PA and A workforce should help us to create additional clinical capacity across the system and so liberate the time on the part of doctors that, that can then be invested in other activities, including supporting high-quality training opportunities for doctors in training. Uh, now, clearly, we, we need to make sure that we are uh, carefully planning any plans for future growth of PA and A roles in order to ensure that there is sufficient educational supervision capacity across the system in order to, to support those individuals alongside doctors in training. And certainly, that will be part of the discussion that takes place through the MAPS Implementation Programme Board that the Cabinet Secretary referred to a short while ago. So, um, we will be sure to ensure that um, any future plans around growth take account of the, the training needs of those doctors in training in the system as well. Okay. Just another wee quick question. It's about um, the, the scope of practice of anaesthesia associates, for instance. And uh, so, in, in my experience as an operating room nurse, um, the anaesthesia associates would anaesthetise. Uh, patients that were pretty young, fit, healthy, they, weren't, they didn't have additional comorbidities, they didn't have um, out of control um, type 1 diabetes, for instance. So there was, it was very structured in the scope of what they were allowed to uh, anaesthetise patients, for instance. It was monitored anaesthesia care. It was, it was, it was quite limited, um, and they would support consultant anaesthetists in other sicker patients, for instance. So in in looking at this taken forward regulation after having um, 20 or 30 years of non-regulated workforce, this is about safety and about making sure mm. that everybody understands the parameters of the scope of practice. The Royal College of Physicians website says that there are over 40 specialties across primary, secondary and community care, and they say the role of the physician associate is varied, dynamic and versatile, and that they're medically trained generalists and they're health professionals. So uh, can I just ask you just to reiterate that this is about optimising the safety of patients, whatever they're being looked after, whether it's in primary care or secondary care and in the community? Well, absolutely. So, uh, given, the, given the role that some of them play at the present moment and the need for us to have a, a statutory regulatory process in place, uh, so that's why I said in my opening statement that the heart of this is patient safety. So, it's about accountability. So, for healthcare professionals and the role that they carry out and, and the very important role that uh, PAs and AAs play, and you mentioned, for example, around anaesthesia assistants and the role that they can play within the theatre environment. Um, it's important they're also accountable for how 
uh, how they manage that uh, uh, provision. Um, of course, they carry out these things under medical supervision uh, as well, but it's important that they, there is very clear lines of accountability uh, and, and responsibility that goes, go with that. So uh, that's all the more reason as to why we need to get into a regulatory environment where we've got statutory regulation of the uh, of these groups, uh, which I think is in both patients' interests and I think it's also in a wider healthcare system's interests that they are properly regulated, the role being clearly defined, and also very clear accountability uh, for any decisions or actions that they take uh, that they, they should be held to account for uh, in a way that other healthcare professionals are. Okay, thank you. Thanks. Paul Sweeney. Thank you, Convener. Um, I would just like to pick up on points raised by the Association of Anaesthetists um, in response uh, to our call for, for um, views on this matter. Um, they highlight the um, issue of distinction of registration. Um, so whilst they welcome the different registration number that A's and P's will have to distinguish them from doctors uh, under GMC registration numbers, they've called for a separate register um, that's distinct from doctors, whether that be online or in print form. Um, this is order to provide absolute clarity for patients and others accessing the registers. It is to protect everyone from accidental or deliberate misrepresentation. There is no legitimate reason that this could not be done with modern information technology systems. Would the Cabinet Secretary be sympathetic with that perspective? Yeah, I understand our concerns. I'll ask Nigel maybe to say a bit more in terms of just the practical application of the, uh, the process and, and how the GMC might address some of these issues. Thank you, Secretary. Yes, um, in terms of the, the sort of modern IT uh, infrastructure that you've you've mentioned. Um, it's it's important to note that all this data will be held on a database by the GMC. Um, it's it will be in reality in one database. It will be searchable according to the individual professions, and the individual professions will have a slightly different uh, alphanumeric format or a basis for their actual registration number. So, in reality, it will appear, to all intents and purposes, to be separate registers. Okay. So, if I were, say, searching for a, a, an individual, I would have I, I could only search one doctor's register, and then I would have a separate web page to go into to search for physicians' well, associates, would, or anaesthetists' would, associates. You would be able to uh, filter. Filter. Uh, but it. This is this is work in progress, and that's right. a matter for the GMC um, uh, as part of their broader programme and how they actually bring these groups into regulation once the legislation is in place, because they can't begin that process properly. Yep. Uh, their council can't take those decisions until they have the actual powers to do so. Okay. Do, does, do you as an organisation have a role in d discussing the specification of such matters with the GMC, or is that a matter entirely for the GMC? It's a matter for the GMC's council to make the final decisions, but we do work closely with the GMC's office in Edinburgh and okay. uh, also their headquarters in London. Okay. It's worth adding that this now brings the GMC into the uh, competence of the Scottish Parliament, which ultimately uh, obviously could be accountable to the Parliament and to this committee um, if it believes it's not taking an approach which it believes is consistent with what mm. they think is mm. uh, the right way to do things. Yeah. So. So it provides the committee with a, a direct route into the GMC in a way that hasn't been there previously. Yeah, that's certainly a, an interesting point that you've raised, Cabinet Secretary. Just also want to quickly raise the point of scope of practice, also raised as a, a concern um, by the Association of Anaesthetists. They highlight that there should be a national scope of practice for AEs, both in their qualification and for any postgraduate extension of practice. Um, and that any future changes to scope should be developed in conjunction with the regulator and should be agreed at a national level, and that it shouldn't be for, for example, individual health boards to, to, to determine that. Do, would you agree that that's uh, an appropriate way forward? Do you have a, anything to say on that matter? So, so it's part of the work that we're looking for the national board to take forward. Scott Wood to say a bit more about that, but I think there is a need for us to make sure there's a consistency of approach um, in yeah. the use. Absolutely. So, so scope of practice in relation to PAs and AEs, um, it will be individual uh, specific to the individual healthcare professional in question, so it will take account of the, the skills and knowledge that they have attained in the course of their initial training. 
Um, it will reflect any constraints or limitations associated with the role in which they are deployed at a given point in time. And finally, it will reflect the skills and experience that they have attained over the course of their careers in the form of continuing professional development. So, in the case of PAs, where we have heard, of course, that they can be deployed in a wide range of healthcare settings, it is hard to draw firm lines in terms of scope of practice. Uh, you need to create some flexibility. That said, we are very happy to look at what further guidance might be required, exactly as the Cabinet Secretary described earlier on in his, his comments, in order to support organisations supervisors and um, PAs and AEs themselves to define that scope of practice. Now, um, we already have guidance published by the Association of Anaesthesia Associates around scope of practice to, su to support those discussions at the moment, and we understand that the Faculty of Physician Associates are currently considering producing similar guidance. So we will keep a close eye on the development of that guidance, keep it under review, um, and then we will consider what further action we need to take to supplement that in order to de deliver the Once for Scotland approach to the deployment of these rules that we want to see for, for NHS Scotland. Okay. I appreciate your, your comments. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can I thank the uh, Cabinet Secretary and his officials for uh, answering the committee's questions. We now move to agenda item four, which is the formal debate on the affirmative instrument on which we have just taken evidence. Cabinet Secretary, can I now ask you to speak to and move motion S. 6M11668. I have nothing further to add, convener, but I am happy to move the motion. Thank you. Can I remind the committee that members should not put questions to the Cabinet Secretary during the formal debate, and officials may not speak in the debate, and I invite members who wish to contribute to make themselves known. Sanders Gohani. Thank you, convener. Uh, I, I'm not sure if I need to register, um, declare my register of interest again, but I shall do as a practising NHS GP. Um, so I have met with um, Association of Anaesthetics, uh, BMA, Scottish GMC, <coughs> on multiple occasions about um, physicians' associates uh, and anaesthetic associates, and I have a number of concerns about the role. Um, and that's really important when it comes to regulation, because you can't regulate someone or a body if you don't know what their role and scope of practice is. Um, so supervision level has not been defined. Is it one to one? Is it two to one? Is it three to one? You know, and these numbers go on. Um, and you know, Emma Harper, in her questioning, spoke of the tightly defined role of an anaesthetic associate in the US. But let's look at the two issues that we have here. Um, the first is those fit and healthy patients that Emma Harper spoke about are actually exactly the type of patients our junior doctors require to train. Because when you start off, you cannot start off on the really complicated patients. You need to start off on patients who are, are, are fit and healthy and, and people that you can, you can anaesthetise, obviously with supervision. But that, that's really important. So it does impede training and potentially even more. Also, here... I have heard of. Um, it, let me make these points, and then yes, I will. Um, so here, I've also heard of anaesthetic associates anaesthetising children. Um, I've also, um, I'm also concerned about how anaesthetic consultants know how to supervise and what their reg their level of, um, of of when something goes wrong, what their level of cover is when this happens. And they have never been trained on how to supervise uh, anaesthetic uh, associates. Convener, through yourself, I, I'm just interested. Um, Sanjay Skahani, you appear to be making an argument against physicians' assistants and anaesthetic... I can't say the word. AAs, shall I say. When we've heard that they've been practising for, for 20 years and that this instrument is about regulation of those professionals... Can I just be clear, are you, are you making an argument against us having those professionals in the system? No. Okay. What, I'm, what I'm arguing is, is, yes, this is about the role uh, of regulation. Of course regulation is important, it, it must occur. But you cannot regulate what you cannot define. So scope of practice is a very important part of that regulation, uh, and as is supervision level. Um, scope of practice, we know that there has been an expansion in what it is uh, our PAs and AAs have been asked to do. Uh, and, and turning to PAs, I know of GP practices almost entirely running on allied health professionals, thus saving the practice money. Um, but 
providing potentially a two-tier system and service to patients in remote and rural areas uh, where they're not going to be seeing doctors in the main. They're going to be seen um, uh, by, by others uh, and with that expansion of that PA role. Also... Um, on that point? Yes. So is, uh, is uh, Sandish Gohani arguing against multidisciplinary teams and not acknowledging the advanced practice that there is in specialties within nurses and AHPs to uh, provide actually better and more appropriate care at times to patients in those practices? No, uh, and the, the work that I, I do with my MDT is absolutely vital. Our pharmacists, our, our nurses, in fact, I can, I can tell you that my practice nurse uh, handles diabetes better than I do because that is uh, a lot of, of what she does. But my argument is <coughs> you're seeing an expansion in the roles of a PA, which, is, which means that they are no longer looking to get doctors into that practice. They are expanding into the PA, uh, thus creating this dichotomy. Um, and the last thing I'd like to say is I've also heard of reports of PAs setting up privately, saying that they can offer all the same services. So if we can't define the supervision level and we can't define the scope of practice, it's very difficult to be able to regulate. And these things have to be very tight and have to be defined in the same way that Emma Harper spoke about when we were talking about what happens in the US. Thank you. Hi. Emma Harper. Thank you, Convener. I just want to clarify that, like, in my experience in the US, it was it's very regulated and and when I describe the fit and healthy patient, you know, the American Society of Anesthesiologists have an ESA classification for fitness to um, of patients to undergo anaesthesia. So it's a classification one through four. So that's already in use in this country. Um, we we use it. Um, it's been done like it's a long time since I worked in the operating theatre for seven years. But um, you know in, we we use this classification for junior doctors to be able to assess patients so that then they can have. A, a registrar do an anaesthesia um, um, surgery or a, a consultant, for instance, and then it allows an assessment uh, of a patient through safety and everything like that. So the scope of practice that they do, they're already working within a scope of practice. And again, this is one of the, uh, you know, there's lots of different specialties that if we're talking about physicians, uh, associates um, in the community or in GP practice or whatever. I think what we need to be careful about is that this is about regulation, where there has been an absence of regulation, so that we can promote safety and um, for patients, no matter where where they're working. You know, I've worked in areas of uh, departments where you know care can be led by a team with lots of different people with different scope of job and everybody knows their role and, and it works absolutely fine and ultimately in a team environment the, the physician, the surgeon who's a consultant uh, would have the, the buck stops here um, type of ability to direct the care. So I, I am interested in the whole issue around supporting our PAs and AAs in order to practice and develop their scope. And I don't think we're suggesting that the PAs and AAs are going to be calling themselves doctors. Thank you, Ms Harper. Um, if that's all the contributions from members, uh, Cabinet Secretary, uh, would you like to sum up and respond to the debate? Yeah, thank you, Convener. And I've listened very closely to the issues that have been raised by uh, members of the committee uh, on this matter. Um, I think ultimately we should keep in mind this is about <coughs> helping to promote patient safety. Uh, so, for example, the use of uh, PAs, for example, even PAs setting themselves up in private practice are unregulated. Uh, as it stands at the present moment. My view is that they should be regulated and we need to be clear about the terms of that regulation as well. I think it's also worth keeping in mind is that most health regulators don't operate on the basis of setting out scope of practice. What they do is that they, they supervise or they deal with issues on the basis of whether you were within 
the scope of your competence in the role that you actually had because people progress through their careers and get greater experience and understanding and as a result they should be operating within the scope of their competence at that particular point and that happens right across uh, healthcare professionals uh, in, in how the regulatory process operates. Additionally, aspects such as supervision are dependent again on someone's scope of experience uh, and the skills which they have. Someone who may move into a new area where they have got less experience and less knowledge may be put on an increased level of supervision in order to achieve that experience and that knowledge. So therefore, the issue of, I think, this issue of scope of, uh, you call, um, uh, scope of practice is something which the regulators already deal with in terms of they deal with issues whether you go out with the scope of your, your competence and your practice ability. And supervision is, is a very dynamic uh, provision. It is very much dependent, again, on the environment and someone's skills and their needs at that particular uh, point. And, you know, I know when I qualified, my level of supervision was greater than it was as I moved through my career, reflective of the experience and knowledge which you, you build up. And my regulatory body would expect that to happen um, in terms of uh, my competence. And I also think the issue of the, for example, the use of things like PAs, etc., within general practice right now, the uh, for general practice, they're out with the scope of even the letter, the direction that we've set as a Scottish government, because they can be directly employed by uh, a GP practice to be deployed in a way that they see is most appropriate uh, for their needs. We are not able to give any direction around that in the way in which we can within NHS as it stands, again, why they should be regulated. So I think, signing off, sorry, uh, convener, I think the key thing here is that, um, is that there is a process being taken forward by the GMC uh, in order to ensure that both PAs and A's are appropriately regulated. And I don't think that it is in the interests of patient safety for these professional groups who are already with us uh, and operating within our healthcare system to remain unregulated. And in my view, it will enhance patient safety and accountability by introducing this regulation, which is why it's critical that this order is passed today by the committee. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. The question is that motion S6M11668 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. No, we are not all agreed. Um, and I will call a division uh, by inviting members to indicate in sequence by show of hands those for the motion. Those against the motion. And any abstentions. Thank you. So the result of the vote is for the motion eight, against the motion two, and there were no abstentions. Thank you. And that concludes consideration of the instrument. At our next meeting, we will be taking evidence on the draft Funeral Director Code of Practice 2024 from the Minister for Public Health and Women's Health. And that concludes the public part of our meeting today.